Our next speaker, uh, Dr. Doug Becker, a well-known figure in electrophysiology, he's talking about renal denervation, not only for heart failure or hypertension, but also for cardiac arrhythmias. Okay. I have to say that I'm very nervous. And the reason why I'm very nervous is that um, it's late, we're an hour over, it's an afternoon session. Most of you are probably brain dead. How many of you are brain dead? <laughs> yeah, I'm brain dead. Um, and uh, I'm talking about kidneys. So where can, where can that come from? So these are my disclosures. I have advisory board sorts of things that I do, and I don't receive any money for doing that. And I have research funding from a variety of different sources, and uh, I do have to account for that. And then we have some intellectual property that we've licensed. And the last paragraph talks about that. So we look at something like this. This is from Shiv Kumar, because our VTs, when we ablate them, don't look like this. Ours just have little dots where the VT is coming from when we ablate them, and it's the end of it. But here he's got endocardial on the left, and he's got epicardial on the right. You can just see how much substrate mapping was required in order to make this VT ablation work. There's got to be better ways. And so we've kind of evolved through the notion of using our knowledge about neural interventions. And the place where we use those most at Mayo is in stellate ganglionectomies, and that's largely because of Mike Ackerman. And so Mike has done a number of studies and has taught us a lot, uh, and so has Chris Moore, who does these surgical procedures, about the ablation of the stellate ganglia and the first five thoracic ganglia and eliminating their input. Most of the time we do the left side, sometimes we do the right side. It, we do it in patients that have had VT storms. They've had a number of different uh, ablative attempts, and they've been on a variety of different drugs. And I think we understand that. We understand what the relationship is between those sympathetic ganglia and the brain. And we understand what the difference is between right-sided innervation and left-sided innervation to a greater degree. So this one, I think, is a little bit easier. Here, Mike is showing us that above, there's a patient that's got long QT syndrome. And below, the patient has had a, a left-sided sympathectomy, no longer having any uh, long QT. Now, we do this in, in catecholamine-mediated polymorphic BTs. We do it in, in um, Brigada's patients and mostly in long QT syndrome patients. And we do it in patients where we've ablated them and they've, been, had, they've uh, had a device put in and they've been on a variety of different drugs and they're still having major problems with VT. This gives you an idea. You can just look at that quickly and see what kinds of patients we have uh, intervened upon. I should say Mike Ackerman has uh, intervened upon. And, and in the initial study that I showed you, he'd reported about 70 patients. He's now done about 150. And the outcomes look pretty good. You know, if you look at the KM curves, you see that those that have uh, undergone the left and sometimes right sympathectomies do very, very well compared to those that don't. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who's got long QT syndrome should undergo that procedure. So now we start talking about the renal arteries. And we find out that they have both afferents and efferents. They've got sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, ganglia that are associated with them, and, and I get totally and completely confused because if you look at not just the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems, look there at the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, anywhere along those pathways you can make fairly substantial inroads into changing autonomic or adrenergic tone. So how do you then proceed from there to make any sense about using a sympathectomy or a, a renal denervation to get you anywhere. And it's also more problematic to me because I thought, at least back in the days of Hippocrates and, and others, that you know the brain was the seat of the soul. And then we start talking about the heart being the seat of the soul. And now, as near as I can tell, it's the kidneys. And for all I knew, that's just kind of what you do, you know, you use to make urine. And so my talk basically is going to be to say you kind of need to think, think differently about this. Think differently because there are other issues.
about norepinephrine transmitter release. It can be very regional. You can have great activation in one region, and you can have a decrease in another, and it can be equal, and it's all depend upon multiple feedback loops. Now here, this one is a little bit hard to see, but if you look at the, if you look at the kidneys, the kidneys have afferents that go through the dorsal root ganglia, they go up the posterior lamina, and they go straight up, and they have effects on about three major nuclei. One is the solitary tract nucleus that's right in there. There's one that's the paraventricular nucleus. It's up high above the hippocampus. And then there's the rostral ventrolateral medulla. Now, I think, DJ, we should have a test on this. I think that people should know those things because that's where the afferents go. And then there's a series of interactions that are inhib inhibitory and stimulatory that then turn into efferents that go down the intermedial lateral cell lines, and they can go through celiac ganglion plexes, they can go through superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric, mesenteric, and they get back down to the kidneys. And so you can have afferent effects, you have efferent effects. They work against each other, and it's, it's quite problematic. So how do we use that to our advantage? Now, if you look again, and for those of you on this side of the room, if you look again, they're prevertebral and periaortic ganglia, you, you, again, you can see some that are celiac and some are superior mesenteric, and some ultimately are from inferior mesenteric. Where they are depends on how far away you are from the aorta. Very close to the aorta is the majority of these uh, ganglia, uh, or the, the plexes that we need to deal with if we're going to do something with renal denervation. As you get further away, then they get further away, and they become progressively less important. Now, this is something that Sam uh, put together, and I think this is a very good, good click once, please. Did a very nice job here. Again, if you're going to go in and you're going to ablate in a renal artery, then you're going to affect first the afferents, and the afferents are going to be taken out. They're going to be taken out going up to the dorsal, through the dorsal roots, and having an impact on those nuclei that I told you about, and then those are going to be taken out, and it's going to have an impact on the stimulation of the efferents. Some of those happen to go to blood pressure responding uh, tissues. Some of those go to the heart rate. Some of those go to refractoriness. So it's a very complicated thing, and I think it's complicated to talk about complicated things if it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we're already an hour behind. <laughs> but it's cool. I mean, how many of you could have given a rip about kidneys before I started talking? <laughs> how many right now are just kind of going, whoa, this is way cool? And hopefully you'll think that even more as we go further with this. Well, there are a variety of different ways that these interact. And one can demonstrate that through ablation of the renal artery, efferents and afferents, you can have some very, very substantial differences between the musculosympathetic nerves, whether you're talking about bursts per minute or whether you're talking about bursts per 100 beats, and the probability that they're going to be firing. And you can do it at one or two different spots, and you can see some very good reproducibility. So it's not just a matter of simply stimulating the renal afferents and efferents and finding that there's no effect on them, you can actually see bursts, and those bursts go away as you ablate them. And they can be very simple bursts, or they can be very complicated bursts in the musculosympathetic uh, activity. Well, let's talk about approaches to renal denervation. Well, there are a variety of different ways you can do it. This is pretend, by the way, for those who aren't sure. This is not pretend. This is kind of like doing Legos, you know, with, with the grandkids. But, you know, if you advance a catheter in, then the plexes are going to be wrapped around the renal artery on both sides, sometimes a few more on the right side than on the left side. And the way that these are ablated typically is they're ablated someplace between four and eight times in a rotational fashion around the vessel. This happens to be the approach that was used in the Simplicity One approach, and for 
energy typically deliveries were made. Well, this is what it looks like when you're just on the outside, whether you're further in. Now, if you're using simplicity type tools, then you use eight to 10 watts for two minutes and you make six lesions. And then what you do is you see what the blood pressure response is to stimulating those nerves. And if you've ablated it appropriately, you stimulate and the blood pressure doesn't change with those nerves. And so that's kind of an end point. I also told you about the spiking that occurs. Well, here's another one. This is, this is one that was used in, in another approach, in the enlightened multi-electrode approach. This is a basket that has four electrodes. You deliver four sequential ablations, again, kind of going around the trail, and then you pull it back and you do four more. Each of these done for about 90 seconds. It's a little bit different here. You kind of watch the temperature, and if the temperature goes up more than five degrees, then you come off. Here's another one, where it's a helical unipolar electrode that delivers for two minutes for RF ablation. And that's kind of built within a single balloon. It's kind of a one-shot sort of approach. This is a V2 renal denervation. It's got coils, and these coils uh, do what coils do. They coil around, and you deliver energy through those coils. When you do that, then you can ablate inside a balloon. Again, one shot in the same location. The question with all of these is, Efficacy and safety. This one is the Paradise system, and this is actually ultrasound. So with ultrasound, you turn on about 30 watts. Anybody who uses ultrasound knows that if a paper says 20 watts, I think I said 30, but 20 watts, then somebody doesn't quite know what they're doing because it has to be a certain number of watts for a given area or area squared but they do it for about 30 seconds, and that takes out those same spirals of the plexi. So let's look at hypertension. That's kind of where this has taken uh, the greatest foothold. This is simplicity one. And so with simplicity one, they looked at six months, but I'm giving you the 24-month data because I think it's more consistent. You can see what the demographics look like. You can see uh, what number of patients had diabetes, and you can see what the blood pressure was. Usually you need a systolic blood pressure of 160 or greater. If you've got diabetes, 150 will do. You have to have failed at least three drugs. These patients failed five. And you can see the difference or the decrease in both systolic and diastolic pressures consisting over or persisting over a 24-month time frame. So it took about 38 minutes, four ablations per artery, lots of narcotics and sedatives. How many of you are doing this? How many of you learned, like we have, that these really hurt? And so you have to be careful with these. In simplicity one, not too bad as far as minor complications. So let's look at simplicity two. This is a bit more randomized, more patients. There are about uh, 90 patients that were involved in this one. Same kind of an approach. You can see the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria. For those of you who are cardiologists and couldn't give a flying rip about VT or AF, these are the patients you refer for uh, hypertension management. And typically three or more uh, antihypertensive drugs, and you can see what the age groups are, and you can see reasons why you wouldn't want to go there. Well, here's the outcomes, the same sort of thing. You can see it numerically, or you can see it in the charts where the sympathetics or the uh, uh, systolics and diastolics both are down. And they're down, you know, the, the reports are six and 12 months, but the registries go even further than that. This is kind of interesting because what it does is it shows here the ones that got renal denervation, this many had really high blood pressure, not many in the control group, but as time went on, at six months, there's a substantial number with very high blood pressures, and the same sort of thing kind of applies with uh, other blood pressure ranges. And so it appears to be effective in doing what it's doing. There's a pseudoaneurysm that occurred and a little bit of drop in blood pressure requiring a reduction in medication, a urinary tract infection, prolonged hospitalization for paresthesias, back pain treated with pain medication. So there are things going on that, that um, you know, make us think that it's not completely foolproof. There are issues that can occur. Changes in renal function doesn't seem to be much of an effect here in simplicity too. Now if you look at Enlighten, 
Then the Enlightened had a similar randomized approach, and these, these words are too small for me to see and even claim that I know what they're talking about, but um, the, the same sort of thing. So now we're seeing with three or four different uh, devices the same sort of thing. Someplace between a 10 and 20% drop in blood pressure for diastol or systolics, and someplace between a 10 and 5% for uh, diastolics. And you can see over time, over the course of six months, how this plays out. So we're finding that the mechanisms that I suggested in the first place appear to be operative in dropping blood pressure over time. Now, this is one more, and I, I put this on just because it was Vivix, and I don't know if Vivix is here or not, but he basically showed the same things at one, three, and six months with drop in blood pressure. Now, the same sort of thing has been seen in SF36 quality of life outcomes. They improve. And you can look at those and take a long time looking at those. But the other thing is psychometric analyses also improve after renal denervation. Now, is this placebo effect? Or is this because people don't feel like their heads are going to explode because they don't have such horrendific hypertension? I don't really know, and I think it needs to be worked out. If you look at the cost effectiveness, this top diagram that I threw up there from uh, this paper is all the different ways that you could measure cost effectiveness. And if you look down underneath, it turns out that it's about $3,000 per qual for quality um, for, uh, per life year, quality improvement per life year benefit. That's actually pretty good. Um, it's not life year saved, but it still is pretty good. Okay, so let's look at a couple of other things. Because of all of this, the uh, consensus document from the European Society of Cardiology, because, by the way, Heart Rhythm Society hasn't done this yet. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, they beat us again. Um, but if you look at the five trials, they use these to make their decisions about what's going on, and, and I talked with you about simplicity and enlighten, but the V2 trial and the Paradise trial basically showed the same things, and I don't think we have time to go through those very much. But they say patients that have blood pressures greater than 160 or 150 with diabetes, they failed three or more antihypertensives, so they need lifestyle modification, and that's failed. Um, we've already excluded secondary hypertension and the exclusion of pseudo-resistance to uh, other agents, you know, that is kind of the list of note for considering renal denervation. So let's talk about heart failure. There's not a lot written. Uh, Davies wrote one paper, and this is actually a fairly interesting paper, and if you look at this, not real impressive in terms of numbers, and there simply aren't large trials, but this shows that activity in terms of exercise distance continually goes up over the course of time. That's interesting. This is another chart from that uh, paper, and it basically just demonstrates the reduction possible in the antihypertensive drugs over time, and anti-heart um, failure drugs over the same time frame. Now, one other thing that we know, particularly in non-ischemic uh, dilated cardiomyopathies, there's a lot of nerve sprouting. And if you look at these next two slides, you can see, particularly in the upper one, A, to the far right, the, the, the non-ischemics, the number of nerves that are there. You also see that on the line in figure B, and you see the changes in figure C. And we don't particularly know what these do yet. And we don't particularly know whether or not doing something with renal denervation is going to make a huge difference for heart failure. But we do think we know that if you're doing sympathectomies, ganglionectomies on the left or the right side, that there may well be uh, an outcome that's of benefit there. So increasing nerve sprouting also within the stellate ganglia that have an effect to counter the effects of heart failure. So let's talk about renal denervation and atrial fibrillation. Um, and I, I still have at least 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Pokushilov and um, Jonathan Steinberg's paper on taking patients and randomizing them to pulmonary vein isolation, to pulmonary vein isolation, and renal denervation. 
And the thing that they found is they found that if they delivered 8 to 10 watts of uh, power for two minutes and made six lesions, then the blood pressure response to stimulation would be eliminated. And if you look at the blood pressure response, whether it's the left renal artery or the right renal artery, there's a substantial change uh, over time when that intervention's made. And the KM curves, and we all know KM curves don't lie, especially when you have a paper that's got about 10 people in one group and 10 people in the other group. But it appears that the pulmonary vein isolation and renal denervation patients did better than the pulmonary vein isolations alone. There's also information about that in atrial fibrillation and sleep apnea. Now, if you look at this, what, that, what all these show is tracheal compression to kind of mimic sleep apnea. And when that happens, the ERPs drop tremendously. And if you do renal denervation, they don't drop as much. And if you have renal denervation and attenol on a little bit of atropine, then they don't drop at all. So that big overshoot of blood pressure doesn't occur. Now, if you also do that, if you look over here in the, in the, second, in the, the second figure, see here you can see that this is baseline. This is post-renal de denervation. And if you look at that as that goes on and you do the renal denervation or add a tenolol, you get down to a point where you can't initiate atrial fibrillation particularly when you have tracheal occlusion changes. Now, on your desktop, there's a survey about tasers and guns. I'd like to have you add a section on tracheal compression. <laughs> Same thing happens with postapneic blood pressure. It goes way up after an aptic spell, and if you've done renal denervation, that doesn't happen and it doesn't happen with a tenolol. So there's another thing to suggest that there might be something to do with renal artery denervation and something like sleep apnea. Now in this study, these investigators, this BOM study, showed that it slows down heart rate when you do renal denervation. But it doesn't necessarily eliminate all the remodeling that might occur. If you look there, if it's a sham in AF, you can see the ERPs are fairly short. If you go over to the right, the ERPs with uh, renal denervation can be about the same. Not a lot of difference with remodeling. In this one, however, if you look at the ventricular and atrial cycle lengths, the ventricular cycle lengths drop, the atrial cycle lengths don't change with or without renal artery denervation. And the, the amount of squiggly lines for the atrial action potentials are really not different. So there's, there's no clear evidence that it's going to change the actual underlying electrograms, but there is evidence that we can change remodeling a little bit in that these episodes last a shorter period of time. That's the bottom right-hand side. They still have atrial fibrillation, but the episodes last a shorter period of time. Well, let's go on to VT applications and see what we know. Number one, this is basically only one paper that's out there in any major way. And what they did is they took a number of patients who had VT storm, and they did renal artery denervation and looked at one week, after two weeks, after three weeks, and after four weeks, and saw a dramatic drop in the occurrence of VT storm. So does that mean that everybody who has VT storm needs a defibrillator, an endocardial ablation, an epicardial ablation, and most certainly renal artery denervation? I don't know, but it's interesting in that this suggests that the pathways that Sam talked about and I talked about might have relevance. And this is just more polymorphic VT that the renal arteries get denervated and they go away. Heart rate variability changes, at least in one study. And so what Vivek is doing is he's looking at the SAFE S study. He's going to see whether renal artery denervation does anything with heart failure. <laughs> 
And what he, what he, what he saw is that what I had showed you before is that there is a, there's a slight change in blood pressure as time goes on, kind of an auto afterload reduction. He's doing a study called Rescue VT that's looking for people with lots of shocks. And then one that's just done in conjunction with VT ablation, and you can see the paradigm. So I'm going to end with about three more slides about complications. With coherence uh, ultrasound, these investigators, this is from Templin, saw edema, saw thrombus, saw thrombus with pullbacks, saw vasospasm, saw disconnections in the tissue, uh, and saw some dissections. They saw changes in vessel diameter with some minor narrowing. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at the tomographic ultrasound, in the square on the bottom, you can see a little bump. Is that part of dissection? Is that atherosclerotic changes? What is it? I don't know. You can see the difference along the along G down at the bottom, how very different these vessels can look. You can see all of the crud in figures C and F, and some of that's thrombus. And I think it's important that for you guys in the Heart Rhythm Society that when you write this, that you use very specific terms like crud, <laughs> because it's something that we all understand. And there can be dissections with this. So I think there's a lot to learn, both from the standpoint of efficacy and safety. Uh, in a VT storm from Shiv Kumar, there were a couple with dissections, a couple with some hemodynamic uh, instability, and a couple with recurrent VT. In Simplicity 2, there was some aggravating hypertension. There was a TIA. There was a hypertensive event after and then some temporary nausea and edema and a coronary stent needed for angina. Now, does that have anything to do with renal denervation? I don't know, it might. It might, so we're going to have to learn a lot about this. This is now from the Worthy study looking at adverse events that occur, and there's a whole list of them there. So I guess I would suggest that before everybody takes off and ablates their next door neighbor's renal arteries or just look at the person that's sitting next to you, Anne. Um, now, now, mind you, Rich may need his renal arteries ablated. But before you do it, I suggest that we all consider these kinds of issues. So hopefully this has been a little bit interesting. The, you know, the kidneys are the, the source of the soul. Um, <laughs> and we can modulate them with renal artery uh, denervation. And it looks like it's going to make a fairly big difference. The question is, how do you control it? And so I'm going to end there and say thanks for the invitation to be here and hope that the level of brain deadness is not quite as bad as it was before. <laughs> Thank you.